Hello again. Thank you for joining us. This is Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, and I'm glad you could join us yet again. Coming up on this episode, Starliner. Yes, we have another update. This is a really strange problem. <laughs> a really strange problem. Nothing to do with noises coming from the inside of uh, the Starliner either. It's it's a completely different problem. They probably never anticipated. We're also going to visit planet WASP 76b because it's got rain that you never want to get involved in unless you love heavy metal. Uh, the Kuiper belt is busier than we thought, and they think they know where all the water went on Mars. It's not here, but it's somewhere. We'll tell you all about it on the current episode of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And to tell us all about it is the man himself, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hello, Andrew. It's good to be the man himself. I appreciate that very much. Better than being the man somebody else. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it probably happens sometimes. Probably. Yeah. Um, no, good to see you too. We we should get stuck straight into this because we have got a lot to get through and uh, some of these stories are extraordinary. Uh, we talked about Starliner last week and the issue of that noise coming from the inside, which uh, turned out to be feedback on their audio system, uh, which is not a big problem. You just turn off the speaker or the microphone yes. or both. Uh, but the, the new problem uh, is uh, one involving the two uh, astronauts who are basically stuck on the International Space Station because of the technical hitches that the Boeing Starliner is suffering. We're talking about um, uh, Butch Wilmore and Suni Williams. Uh, now, they, they've, they're looking at how they're going to get them back. There's talk of getting them back sometime next year. Uh, but uh, a new problem has arisen as a consequence of one of the potential solutions. That's correct. <laughs> um, the So the potential solution, uh, which is what's going to happen, and uh, some of this may have already happened by the time this episode goes to air, in particular the uh, Star, Starliner itself might have come back uh, empty, which is the plan at the moment. But the problem is uh, when these two Boeing Starliner astronauts, uh, Butch and Sunny, have, as you've mentioned, when they do finally come back, it will not be on a Starliner spacecraft. They will be coming back in a SpaceX Crew Dragon. And the space suits that you use on a Starliner are not the same as the ones that you use on a Crew Dragon, and they're incompatible. Uh, so what it means is that when their trip, when their ferry home is launched up to the space station. Uh, this will be the Crew Dragon that is going to bring them back home next February. It's going up there sometime, we think, this month, September, um, with two empty seats in it. Uh, they will also have to send up two empty space suits for Butch and Sunny. Right. Uh, the, the reason why it's tricky is because it's... You know, once once that once that spacecraft arrives, uh, that's the Crew Dragon later later this month. Once that arrives, the problem's solved because they'll the NASA will send up their correct spacesuits with it. But if there's an issue before then, an issue in which the uh, International Space Station has to be evacuated, and that's always at the back of people's minds, you've got to be ready to get off just in case something goes catastrophically wrong. Yeah, like you know a big bit of space junk colliding with it or something like that. If they had to return, um, they there is a Crew Dragon docked with the space station at the moment, which will carry the current crew of four astronauts uh, in what's called the Crew 8 mission back to Earth. And it will have room for Sunny uh, Williams and Bruce Wilmore. It will have space on a cargo pallet underneath the seat. Oh, so what? They, they, Are you kidding? That's right, yeah. It's like riding in the back of the U. Oh, my really? gosh. <laughs> so they're going to be huddled under there. But the problem is their, their um, spacesuit designed for the Starliner won't work. 
So they're going to have to do it they without have to leave, space. So they have to leave them behind. They have to leave them behind and absolutely. go and go home in their undies. Uh, well, they're, they're, yeah, probably a little bit more than their undies, <laughs> but they will not be protected by a spacesuit, which has been standard practice uh, for many decades uh, in both NASA and Roscosmos flights. That you don't land or launch without your spacesuit on, just in case something goes wrong and the spacecraft depressurizes. Yes, yes. Uh, wow. And, uh, but, but they will be in that situation. Um, it's likely that, you know, I mean, it would have to be a real emergency situation for them to do that. Uh, and you would hope that everything would work out, out all right. Yeah. Uh, but it is, yes, it's putting putting them in an interesting position. So uh, underneath the seats. at the very best, they get to come home um, on February next year. February next year <laughs> with, with alternative spacesuits, but in an emergency could end up having to come back without spacesuits. Wow. Yeah, only if that emergency occurs before only. the Crew-9 spacecraft uh, gets there. So, yeah. So it's a, it's a short window when there is this situation, but it is a situation that uh, has real risks attached. Yeah. Gosh, you know, wouldn't you love to be in a room just watching the people trying to figure all this out? How are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Oh, hang on, there's a new problem. Oh, you know... The, we set that pallet of bricks up. Can we use the pallet? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's exactly right. Wow. Never throw away a good pallet. No, no. no that's right. They're very useful. Um, people make Christmas trees out of them, you know. They're, well, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Yes. My son's got a, a Christmas tree made out of an old pallet. Yeah. Looks nice. Uh, wow. So that's the state of play as we speak, but like we're recording ahead of time to cover a trip of mine, so um, may well be a different story by the time this comes out. But uh, that's 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 a unique problem. I don't think I've ever heard of that one before. Uh, fascinating. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll try to keep you informed, but uh, time might work against us over the coming weeks but um yes it's a it's been a fascinating um it's been a soap opera really hasn't it the, the a little bit <laughs> yes yeah, so sure a line of story yeah mm. boeing wouldn't like it to be called that but i think you're right yeah yeah, yeah well it's better than a horror movie yes okay. exactly okay let's move on to our uh, next story and this one takes us uh, a long way away to a uh, a planet called wasp 76b uh, it was only discovered, what, 11 years ago, uh, but it's been the subject of a, a lot of study and they are learning more and more about it. And what's really good is they've been able to actually optically observe this one, I think, Fred. It's a stinking hot place, though. Australians would like it. We like the heat. <laughs> I'm not sure you like this much, though. <laughs> Um, so yes, uh, it is a star that is uh, very, very close. Sorry, a, a planet that is very close to its parent star. The parent star is Wasp seventy six, and in the normal convention, you put a B after it for the first planet that's discovered around it, and it's Wasp seventy six B, which is the planet that we're talking about. It's about um, something like getting on for twice the size of Jupiter. So it's what we call a hot Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, but it is very, very close to its parent star. Distance is measured almost in centimetres, not quite, but uh, it's uh, actually about 40 million kilometres uh, from its parent star. And now that sounds like a lot, but it's such a, you know, such, such a, a, a close place to its parent star that it goes round... Uh, something like uh, once every two days or thereabouts. This is a ridiculously yeah. short length of time. I can't find the exact figure, but it's it's that sort of length of time. It absolutely whizzes around. Um, it's actually 1.8 uh, Earth days. And so uh, that means a number of things. First of all, because the, the, the star and its planet are so close together, the star is more massive. It's actually, uh, I think, more massive than the sun, um, about one and a half times the mass of the sun. Uh, what that means is that the planet itself is locked tidally, so it always faces its parent star, Wasp mm. 76. And so, uh, you know, it, it's always got a hot side and a not exactly a cold side, but a cooler side. Uh, now, on the hot side, uh, you've got um, a temperature high enough to not just melt iron, 
but vaporize iron. So wow. there is iron vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. It's about 2,400 degrees Celsius or about 4,350 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on the hot side. Now, that, that vapor um, is whizzed around by really strong winds that exist on WASP-76b, and those winds are generated by the sheer heat of of the, the atmosphere being so close to its parent star. So the, this vaporized iron whizzes around to the backside of the planet, the night side, the permanent night side, and there is uh, it gets cooler, cool enough to be not vapor but liquid, yeah. uh, and so it condenses, condenses into droplets of, of iron rain. So iron rain to me does not sound that good. Uh, yes, it's cooler, but not that much cooler. Yeah. Uh, so Gosh, you've got to, you, you'd have to come up with a really good umbrella. <laughs> yeah, I think you would too. Um, so, but that's uh, that's only part of the story. The uh, uh, and I should say that um, this planet has been become almost the personal property of scientists at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Uh, they've done a lot of uh, serious research on this planet, and it's uh, a release from them that's uh, really discovered these these very hot winds of, of vaporized iron. Uh, it's such an extreme planet that it's well worth studying because it gives you an idea of you know how extreme things can be, and 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 sheds light on other planets um, which are also in our part of the universe. Um, so that this, and just an aside, the work that's being done in Geneva is using a telescope that we Australian astronomers also have access to, the ESO European Southern Observatory, very large telescope down in Chile. There's a uh, an instrument on that that is. Um, uh, excuse me, I just have to press a button on my watch here. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, the, the There's an instrument on that that was actually um, built by the University of Geneva. So that's what they're using to make these measurements of the vaporized iron whizzing around the planet. But wait, there's more. Mm -hmm. Because um, some uh, research uh, done, I think, by the same group, um, uh, and published a little while ago, actually. We missed this story back in April. Uh, it's um, work that concerns what might happen to those iron droplets uh, in the atmosphere. Yes, you've got iron rain. Now, where when we have rain on our planet, yeah. um, you, get, uh, you get phenomena like rainbows and things of that sort. And there's evidence uh, that... Phenomena like that are occurring on WASP 76b, um, not specifically rainbows, but rainbow like phenomena. And in particular, it's something called a glory, which most of us have actually seen, believe it or not. And I'm sure you have, Andrew. When does, you it, look does, it the does it happen in the morning? Uh, <laughs> that's a different thing altogether. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And um, I should explain to uh, non-Australian listeners that there is a plant called the morning glory, which blossoms in the morning. Yeah. I'm sure that's what you were talking about, Andrew. Absolutely, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, a glory is uh, is something, you, I was just going to say, you've almost certainly seen it, because if you've looked out of the window of an aircraft that's flying over cloud, you will often see... A little shadow of the aircraft from if you're on the right side of the plane, with circular coloured rings around it, uh, and that's called the glory. It occurs because light is being diffracted by the rain droplets in the clouds, uh, and that diffraction process splits it up into its rainbow colours, and you see this succession of rainbow rings, um, similar to something you might have seen today if you've been looking in the right direction, which is called a pollen corona. <laughs> yes, I, I should uh, go out there and try and take another photo. Yeah, I've, yeah, you got a lovely photo of one last year. That's well, right. yeah, and, and a few years back when you first told me about them and I took up the challenge and I went outside and, and I couldn't see it because it was so bright, but the camera mm. picked it up mm. and got a beautiful mm. photo of a um, pollen corona, yeah. They're quite yeah, extraordinary. Which, they are, and and the corona's a little bit different because it's around the sun when you're looking towards the sun, but it's still caused by the same diffraction effect. And and well, a glory. We've got a is... very windy day today, and it's sunny, 
and the yeah. sun is just yeah, in the perfect position. So I might go out and take a snapshot. Are you going to do it now? Not right this minute. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad to hear that because otherwise I would have had to waffle on for a little while and um, I'd mm. much rather be talking to you. So, uh, yeah, so, but you, you've, you're familiar, I'm sure, with that phenomenon of looking down yeah. from an aircraft. You see the clouds, you see the, often see the shadow of the plane, and around it is this glory, this succession of colored rings. We think that might be occurring on WASP 76B. And the reason why uh, scientists, uh, as I said, at the University of Geneva um, uh, and actually uh, the um, uh, uh, Institute of Astrophysics and Space Science in Portugal, there's a, a group involved with it there too, uh, they have uh, worked out from asymmetries uh in what we call an asymmetric light curve. The light curve is the way the light of this planet varies as it goes around its parent star. And you expect that to be more or less symmetrical because when it is on one side of the star, uh, it's shining with a particular brightness and it should be the same when it's on the other side of the star. But they've discovered it's not. There are asymmetries in it, so it's not symmetrical. And uh, these scientists are putting that down to the existence of the glory on yeah. this, on the, in the clouds of WASP-76b, which is quite an extraordinary claim, really, and an extraordinary discovery. Yeah. What, would, what would an iron, iron rain rainbow look like? <laughs> Pretty hot, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's a good, good question. Um, so it depends on the transparency of the droplets, mm. uh, uh, which um, I find it hard to... You know, to get my head around transparent iron droplets. Yeah, me too. Uh, um, because you think of iron as being a metal, but if it's heated enough and it's on the point of becoming vapor, the droplets might be quite transparent. Yeah, uh, and uh, would give you these various phenomena: refraction and diffraction. Uh, but it's something, yes, we need to look into. And I can hear you typing on your keyboard, so you're probably doing it as we speak. I'm trying to see whether or not um, there is a colour for iron vapor, but um, it's not. It's not something that's been searched for very much. So there's not Before, many no. <laughs> references to it. But uh, oh. yeah, it might be something for another day. Mm. Um, Indeed. Yeah, great story though. So much to learn from WASP seventy six B. And was I right that you? It's one that has been observed optically. Um, I think it's still yes, but not directly. I think what has been measured is the way the combined light brightness of the star and the planet change as it goes around in its orbit. Right. I think that's the optical observations that have been made. Okay, very good. Uh, if you'd like to read up on that story, you can uh, find out more about it, the Iron Rains of WASP uh, 76B in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Oh, that was a short break. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going to take a breath. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't get time for breaths in this. No, no. Uh, our next story takes us to the Kuiper Belt. Now, uh, what's interesting about the Kuiper Belt is, well, just about everything about it. Uh, but now they think it might actually be bigger, deeper, and more occupied than we first thought. Fascinating. Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, a very nice combination of astronomical... Uh, for, uh, um, infrastructure here, because this is work that uh, combines uh, the Japanese Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which is an eight meter class telescope uh, named Subaru after the Japanese name for the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. Uh, and uh, the uh, work has been done in collaboration with the mission scientists of New Horizons, the spacecraft that is leaving the solar system, one of five that's leaving the solar system. Mm. Uh, now, you and I spoke about New Horizons not very long ago because yep. uh, it's used its cameras to to measure 
um, the the night sky brightness, or it's just the brightness of the sky because it's night all the time out there. Uh, this is 60 astronomical units from the Earth, which is where the uh, the spacecraft is at the moment. Remember, one astronomical unit is 150 million kilometers. It's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, so a long, long way, uh, 60 times further away from the Sun than the Earth is. Yeah. Uh, and it's... Um, it, 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 the New Horizons flew by Jupiter in 2015. Sorry, flew by Pluto 2015. Flew by Arakoth a couple of years later, a distant Kuiper Belt object, uh, and used its cameras to very good effect. It's got fantastic cameras on board. Now, uh, the mission team of New Horizons, which is still scanning for new Kuiper Belt objects to try and divert New Horizons to, to have a close look at. Um, Given the limited fuel that they've got on board New Horizons, in order to do that diversion, uh, they've they've got to be fairly careful about what they choose. And at the moment, there are no candidates. Yeah. Uh, and part of the problem for that is that whilst New Horizons has got, as I said, superb cameras on board, they're not wide-angle cameras. They're not the kind of camera that you want to use for searching for potential candidates. And for that, you need a wider field of view, and it turns out, that back here on Earth, back her home on our sunny planet, as it is for me now, uh, the uh, Subaru telescope has a wide field camera, uh, which is capable of detecting uh, these uh, faint objects at these great distances from, from the Earth. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of the two of them has been to identify some Kuiper Belt objects that New Horizons can sort of foam in on, at least with its camera, not necessarily being diverted there, but they can have a look at it with the New Horizons camera because it's much closer than Subaru is. Subaru can find these objects and say, there's a target that you need to look at, uh, and New Horizons can then have a close look at it. And the, the upshot of all this is that it looks as though the Kuiper Belt has more uh, of these icy asteroids in it than we thought. Um, basically, we thought that the Kuiper Belt ran out of steam roughly at the distance where New Horizons is, 60 astronomical units from the sun. Yeah. Uh, but it turns out that there's more. They found uh, a population of these things beyond uh, and in, in the region of a dozen, I think, or so that have been found so far, perhaps a few more than that. But these kind of cluster around 80 astronomical units from the sun. So another, you know, another quarter, sorry, third of the distance away, um, you've got another group of these objects, which is something that was not known. We, we do know that the icy asteroids beyond Neptune, which we call trans-Neptunian objects, we know that they do group into different groups. And the Kuiper Belt is the innermost of those groups. Um, there are some things called scattered disk objects, which are much further away. Um, and I don't think that's what we're looking at, though. We're not looking at the scattered disk. We're looking seriously at the Kuiper Belt and finding that there's more in it than we thought there were. Uh, and the conclusion to be drawn from that is that perhaps the protoplanetary disk around the sun when the planets were being formed was bigger than what we thought it was uh, because we're finding debris out there that is almost certainly left over from that process uh, but is further away from the sun than we expected. Okay. Uh, now someone's going to think of it, so I'll just ask if this is the case and we've got a bigger Kuiper belt than we thought and there's much more junk out there from you know our, our uh, solar system origins, uh, could Planet Nine be a part of that, or is it not? You know, is it further out than than mm. even that? No, it's a great question, and um, the the thinking with Planet Nine is that it is much further away, perhaps twice that distance. Right, uh, and um, but we don't, you know, the the thinking about the hypothetical Planet Nine uh, is that it affects these objects, these really f di uh, most distant. Uh, objects in the trans-Neptunian region beyond Neptune uh, and it changes their orbits. That's that's the thinking why why some astronomers believe that Planet Nine exists. Some believe it doesn't exist as well. I talked yeah. to one yeah. uh, earlier in the year who was a planetary scientist who said no, it's pie in the sky. <laughs> so you've got very different opinions there. But anyway uh, that um, you know, that, that uh, idea of Planet Nine being part of this 
um, you know, part of this new population of Kuiper Belt objects, I think it's too far away to be included with in what is being considered here. Mm, yeah, but it's uh, certainly a great discovery that the Kuiper Belt might be bigger and yeah. you know, contain a lot more objects than we ever thought. So uh, probably a lot more to learn and a lot more to talk about going forward. And you can find out more about it uh, when they... Uh, publish. I think there's a couple of papers on this, uh, which will be published in the Planetary Science Journal. Yeah. Three, two, one. Space nuts. Uh, okay, uh, moving on from the Kuiper Belt to uh, a little rock closer to its parent star, and that is a planet called Mars. And one of the uh, things that gets people scratching their heads about Mars is what happened to the water, what happened to the atmosphere, you know, what happened to all the dogs and cats that lived there. <laughs> um, but uh, we may have an answer on the water issue. Yes, that's right. And again, this is a really nice collaboration between very well-known facilities, uh, and they're both NASA facilities in this case. NASA has a spacecraft in orbit around Mars. It's got a number of spacecraft in orbit around Mars, uh, but one of them is MAVEN, or MAVEN, uh, which is an acronym for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution. So as the name implies, MAVEN is looking at the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, and one of the reasons why MAVEN was sent to Mars, and in fact, it was probably the best part of a decade ago, it's quite a long time ago. Mm. Uh, the reason for that was to look at exactly what we're talking about, the pos prospects of atoms leaving Mars's atmosphere. Um, and the, I guess the, the main culprit, uh, if, especially if you're thinking about water, is hydrogen, because water is hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we think one of the reasons why Mars has lost its water is, uh, is, is because of the dissociation of water into hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen basically escapes from Mars's atmosphere. And, and that has been kind of demonstrated already by MAVEN. Um, but there is an issue with the observations. And it is because uh, during the Martian, I think it's the Northern Hemisphere winter, it's uh, Mars, uh, just to, to step back a minute, but a, a minute Mars, has an, uh, Mars has an orbit which is much less circular than the Earth's orbit. It's highly elliptical, mm. quite, uh, quite elongated. So for part of the year, uh, Mars is significantly further away from the sun than it is uh, at other times of the year. And, you can, you, and what happens is this um, spreading of hydrogen into space from Mars's upper atmosphere, actually in that period when Mars is a long way away, it becomes too faint for MAVEN to see. Uh, and that is why uh, the mission scientists have turned to the Hubble Space Telescope, another NASA facility, yep. which can see Mars pretty clearly uh, and is able to actually provide data on the hydrogen escaping from Mars back to 1991, actually. Uh, and in fact, I've just seen that Maven arrived at Mars in 2014, so my guess of it being the best part of, part of 10 years was right Spot on the money. Spot on. Now, there's a subtlety to this, though, that um, I just must mention, because it's not just the ordinary hydrogen that uh, the Hubble is helping out with. It is deuterium, the heavy hydrogen. And you and I have spoken about this before, that yeah. um, heavy hydrogen uh, has uh, an, an additional neutron, which means its mass is about twice, a uh, mass of a hydrogen atom is about twice uh, what it is, uh, normal hydrogen. We call it deuterium. We sometimes call it heavy hydrogen, but we call it deuterium. If that combines with water, uh, sorry, with oxygen, then you get heavy water. Mm. And it's the ratio between these two that is the clue to what might have happened to Mars's oceans in the distant past. And so these scientists, what they're doing is they're looking at the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium in the gas that is leaving Mars at present. And from that, it's a bit like carbon-14 dating. From that, they can work out, you know, how early in Mars's history that water left, how long it, uh, how long uh, it's been 
uh, be, be, being lost from Mars. Oh, so uh, they can uh, they can do the calculations backwards and see how long. That's that's right. Wow, and the calculations back in time. That's it. Incredible. And so they've they've basically confirmed that it's this um, deuterium that's zipping out into the. No, it's 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 heavier, isn't it? So it's yes. Yeah, so so it probably can... doesn't. Yeah, it's it's the heavy stuff. Probably stays stays closer to Mars than the light stuff. Right. Uh, but you've got to. It's the ratio of the two of them that you're really interested in. Yeah. And that's what's telling the tale. That is th- what's telling the tale. That's right. As uh, is it Fizz dot org puts it. Yeah. Measuring the ratio today gives scientists a clue as to how much water was present during the warm, wet period on Mars. It's fascinating. Yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, it's been sort of zipping off into the uh, into the ether, basically. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Hmm. Well, uh, and it's still happening by the the description you gave. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll, look, I'll read the next sentence to that because it's beautifully put by uh, Fizz.org. By studying how these atoms currently escape, they can understand the processes that determine the escape rate over the last four billion years, and thereby extrapolate back in time. Very nicely done, indeed. I think right. it, I think it actually that might be a NASA press release rather than a Fizz.org article. Though. Okay, but you can read it on Fizz.org. You can also read the study in Science Advances. Uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much, Fred. Ah, it's a pleasure, Andrew. Um, we should do it again sometime. We probably will in a few minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll soon, in a few days. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you, Fred. Uh, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and thanks to Hugh in the studio for being Hugh in the studio, and no one else can be Hugh in the studio. I can tell you that for free. Uh, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks uh, for uh, listening in to another episode. Uh, don't forget to leave some reviews and uh, check our social media and our website while you're at it. And we will catch you again soon on another episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.